But I, I would encourage anybody, and I don't, to, to do when it's raining and you can't get out, uh, when you're preparing weeks ahead of time, uh, there are some great books that, for me, guide my whole philosophy and mindset about nature. The, the first is, and, and tell me if, if you know this one, it's A Sand County Almanac, Aldo Leopold. Uh, I'm rather American-centric because I've lived here all my life. Aldo was a mid-20th century forester, wildlife biologist, conservationist, first name A-L-D-O, Leopold and a Sand County Almanac. He um, had a farm. He bought an old worn out farm uh, up along the Sand River in Wisconsin, an hour or so north of Madison, where he finished his career uh, on the faculty there in wildlife biology and forestry. But he, he writes about his love affair with nature in ways that are timeless. We get Outdoors Nation, I often believe like I have the best job on planet Earth. I get to talk to people who I really want to talk to um, on a very frequent basis and then share the conversation with you as we explore thoughts, opinions, views and um, experiences of the outdoors. And, and today is... Is, is no no different. Today I'm joined by um, a gentleman called Mr. Steve Jones. Um, he just told me, or asked me rather, how he compares to skydivers and base jumpers and Mount Everest summer, summiters and, and, and whatever else. And uh, I said, don't worry, Steve, the, the job is just for us to have a good conversation about what we love about in the outdoors. And we're going to find more out about Steve as we go on. But uh, Mr. Steve Jones, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Rob. Excited to be here. I'm delighted to have you here. So I, I'd, I'd like to start start with this. What is it about the outdoors that originally drew you in and has kept you hooked for all of these years? Uh, and, and the short answer is everything. <laughs> I, I grew up about 150 miles west of the Washington, D.C. area in the very western tip of the state of Maryland. Uh, which is in the heart of the central Appalachians. These aren't towering mountains. They're old, worn down, uh, pretty rough country that prevented European settlers from heading west into the frontier for the better part of a century. Uh, the highest points in where I grew up, uh, I think Maryland's high point is 3,600 feet. And I was blessed with parents, uh, particularly my dad, who loved to fish, hunt, camp, picnic, hike. And, he, and mom was very accommodating in that she participated fully and at least act like she enjoyed it. But uh, dad Im immersed us completely in the outdoors. And I loved everything about it from the exposure to the, the wilds of the weather to tramping through the forest. And um, to this day, I attribute my continuing now seven decade long love, love of nature to dad, getting us out into the forest, uh, along the rivers, and just totally fascinated with every aspect of nature. Uh, it sunk in deeply at a young age, and in effect, recently, three or four years ago, when I officially retired, I burst back into the world of nature uh, with a full-time job, uh, active career. Uh, there, there, the passion was there, but that itch, I couldn't scratch it the way I wanted to. Once I retired, uh, I felt like I had a chance to blossom back into the out there and have enjoyed every day of it. Even two days after the shoulder replacement surgery, two weeks ago, Monday, uh, I talked my wife into driving us out to a trailhead 
a paved greenway and at least walking a few hundred yards, inhaling fresh air and looking at the fall colors and just listening and healing in part through the brief outdoor exposure that day. So everything, Rob, excites me about nature. Uh, and perhaps if we have a moment later in the conversation, even my experiences in what I'll call nature's pleasurable terror. Ah. So not just the beautiful sunsets, but the wild, wicked days in really what other people might consider there's no way I would go out in that kind of weather. I um, We definitely will come to that. I've got uh, a memory in my head being in Arctic Norway in a canoe on my own, pushing up a lake system to get to the truck at the end of the lake. And I've got this wind howling against me and the, the rain howling against me. And it was kind of grim. We'll get there, but it was kind of grim, but immensely pleasurable when you got to the end and had, had harnessed part of nature as well. Uh, okay. So you you have your own memories of pleasurable terror. I Yes. Yes. Plenty of them. So we, we'll, we'll, let's park that rabbit hole. I, w- I want to go there. Um, but w- one of the things that amazed me is that you took this passion and you actually, in your university years, you were doing research and studying into nature and the outdoors and forestry and those sorts of things. And yeah, I suppose, firstly, I would imagine your dad probably supported it actively because he was the person who sowed the seed. But um, as, as a clever guy, you had very many other options of things to research and study. So what was it that directed you towards those lines of study? And it's... It, I. I often say my entire career, my entire life, I attribute to serendipity and fortuity. Uh, I emerged from high school the exact spring before, in the fall, the local community college opened a brand new forestry program. And Uh, I didn't have to cogitate, I didn't have to noodle it, I didn't have to visit numerous colleges and universities. I could stay at home another two years. Not that that was a wonderful thing, but it was a cheap, inexpensive thing. And go enroll in the forestry program at Allegheny Community College in Cumberland, Maryland. And as it turned out, the fellow who started that program Uh, continues to this day, he's in his 91st year, to be my mentor and hero. He took the baton from my dad and helped carry me on the next two years worth of the the long journey that began and continued through my career. Uh, With Doc Workman, uh, I embraced that career, the study of nature. He's He's a botanist, and he, on a spring field session, uh, a laboratory session where we went out into the woods uh, once a week for three hours to botanize with spring ephemeral wildflowers, I fell in love with nature, uh, with spring wildflowers. I continue to this day. When I'm out in the woods, I look for the spring ephemerals. And although I don't remember as many as I want to, uh, it's still absolute fascination. And then that led me to complete my forestry four-year degree at uh, one of the SUNY system schools, the State Mm -hmm. University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse. Uh, We shared a campus with Syracuse University. And from there, I learned, I, I don't like the, the, the saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. But instead, because uh, I dedicated my deep passion to my studies in forestry, uh, I formed a, a strong relationship with one of our professors at Syracuse, who had been head of 
forestry research for a Fortune 500 paper and allied products manufacturing company in the southeastern U.S. And Dr. Johnson arranged for me when recruiters from that company were on campus looking at paper science engineering graduates, even though they they weren't there to look at foresters, he, Doc Johnson arranged for me to meet with them. And as a result, I was able to get a position in forestry in Virginia that uh, introduced me to the company and put me on a fast track within the company over the 12 years I spent there before I decided to go back and get my doctoral degree in forestry back at Syracuse with another professor for whom I had the utmost respect. So uh, uh, meeting Doc Workman, picking the right parents, uh, meeting <laughs> Dr. Johnson, it it all panned out through, again, what I consider to be serendipity and fortuity, a correspondence, if you will, with providential, almost providential uh, occurrences that align to guide me to where I belonged. That's incredible. Now, th throughout your career, there's many things I want to talk on, talk about. But um, uh, in our last conversation, that obviously wasn't recorded, I became aware that uh, not only did you work in academia after the forestry company and getting your doctorate, but you actually... Um, you were the head honcho at a whole bunch of um, academic institutions for a while. Uh, something I'm always curious about, Steve, is it, people who engage in the outdoors often make very good leaders in, in places. Um, what is there that you took from the outdoors and the forestry and used as, as a leader of a large academic institution that you've, that you've been in charge of? Oh, well, that, that's that's a great question. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but can you read the title? Nature-Based Leadership. Got it. Yeah, that was my first book. And I, I became convinced over the year that every lesson for living, for learning, for serving, for leading is either written indelibly in nature or is powerfully inspired. By nature, uh, we're we're part of this natural system of life, earthbound here, that's evolved for 3.7 or 3.8 billion years. Nature knows how to do it. Uh, you you plant a tremendous explosion on the side of Mount St. Helens in 1980 with that volcanic eruption. And here we are, what, 1980, 41 years later. And if you didn't know better and we're out there on the ground, uh, it looks like an undisturbed forest. Mm. Nature knows how to handle adversity. And many aspects of leading, whether it's a university, a corner drugstore, uh, a government, or a Fortune 500 company, is handling adversity, handling change, responding to opportunity. Uh, it, it, again, uh, the, the lessons for leading are written in and inspired by nature. To me, it's a no brainer. But my second book, and I, I don't, I hope you don't mind if I shamelessly. No, no, plug uh, them, go for it. The, the second one is Nature Inspired Learning and Leading. Again, lessons from nature or how to function in life, or how to handle what comes our way, whether, again, solving a problem or rising to an opportunity. We, we need more of nature's inspiration today. Uh, I'll venture to say, especially here in America, but everywhere around the globe. What is it that... Um... I love that, by the way. And I, I'm fully in agreement with you. And I've got my own bias towards it as well, of course. But what is it that nature does that is so remarkable in terms of dealing with adversity and embracing opportunity? Um, I, I don't want to answer for you, but but my version is nature is almost stoic in its approach. Um, 
But, but what, what's, what's your perspective? Oh, na- nature is so well practiced. Uh, nature depends upon having the individual succeed long enough, at least, to procreate and prepare the next generation for all that lies ahead. Uh, nature doesn't care about making a profit, not that that's bad. Nature cares about sustaining life into the future and keeping the species line alive. Uh, Nature has a toolkit that's hardwired for handling, in the case of the Douglas fir around Mount St. Helens, a cataclysmic disaster to simply carrying on the forest generation after generation, even without some kind of event at that level. So nature has the tools hardwired. And it's amazing, and I can't give you a quote right now, but um, if I thought long and hard about it, uh, people of tremendous intellect, uh, I, I constantly turn to Leonardo da Vinci, who wrote extensively and thought deeply about nature and nature's lesson. Uh, That was 500 years ago. Hmm. And then our good friend, John Muir, from 150, 100 plus years ago, also spoke deeply and passionately and intelligently about what we have to learn about nature. Albert Einstein said, uh, it's not that one thing in nature is a miracle. It's that the entire of nature is a miracle. Uh, nature knows how to work together. Uh, nature's colorblind, I think gender blind, and nature's main aim is success and keeping progress and responding to change, disaster, and rising to opportunity. Well, and it's interesting, I suppose, mankind falls a part of that nature. I mean, we are we, we are part of the same thing. We, as humans, are the same as trees in so many respects. Um, but it also strikes me, Steve, that um, people wander through life failing to learn nature's lessons. Do you think that that's because of they don't stop long enough or there's too much pressure on them or the lessons seem insignificant and not clever enough? What do you what do you what do you think some of the reasons are why people don't go and absorb, as you say, the regeneration of the area around Mount St. Helens over the past 40 years? Yeah, I, I and I these observations are rather simplistic and I draw them from. Uh, when I'm biking along a trail in nature, uh, whether it's a paved greenway or an old um, fine gravel rails to trail, uh, wherever I am in nature, the too far too many of the people I see are wearing earbuds. Uh, they're not listening to what they're running through or hiking through. Uh, I feel some of them are blinded by the distractions around them. They're interested in getting the heartbeat up, increasing their endurance. But where they are, I think they're oblivious to them. And I, I th- this is a long way around the elbow, but uh, after now 50 years since my undergraduate dendrology degree, look, identifying tree species, I can do a pretty good job of identifying species uh, driving along the interstate at 70 miles an hour. Granted, I wouldn't want to be tested on it, <laughs> but um, I, I can discern speciation even at 70 miles an hour. When I'm on the bike, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm no... Um, a competitive biker for me a, a good l- ride along the greenway i'll average 
11 miles an hour or so, maybe 12 if I'm fast. And I can see so much more at 12 miles an hour than I can at 70. Uh, I can identify flowers along the path, um, discern, distinguish among most tree species. If I slow down and walk through the woods, that might be two miles an hour. I, I start getting down to a more granular level and can identify the mushrooms that I know. I can I can look closely at the forest litter, uh, at the dead and down woody debris. And uh, the, the, the more I look, the more I see. And so many people don't look at all. And I, I talk about Uh, My five essential verbs for enjoying nature. And and the first one, and most people don't even come close to this, the first verb is believe. And I'm not talking about believing in some higher power, although that can be important. It's believing that there are visual gifts uh, awaiting us as we pass through the forest. The second is to look. Uh, So many people don't even look. They don't suppose there's anything there worth seeing, and they don't bother to look. And and the third third verb involves looking with great discernment, curiosity, and that's seeing. You can't see unless you look. And you can't see anything unless you believe there's something worth seeing as you're passing through. The second essential verb is to feel. And and I don't mean to reach out and feel the bark on the oak tree, but to have, but to see closely and intimately enough that it evokes some feeling of wonder, of awe, of deep appreciation, of understanding. And then the fifth verb is to act. Uh, Through we get outdoors, you are acting. Uh, And I don't mean acting as somebody in a play, but you you are taking a positive step, uh, an effective step, I hope, toward, if I can use the word, spreading the gospel of earth appreciation, enjoyment, and stewardship. So the five verbs believe look, see, feel, and act. And so many people don't even, don't even believe, uh, much less look, see, feel, and act. And, and another facet of that is uh, I've, for the most part, stopped hiking with groups of people because most people who hike are are focused mostly on getting from point A to point B. Uh, They walk through the forest uh, while I walk in the forest. Uh, I'm not concerned about getting to B in 47 minutes. Uh, If it takes me three hours, uh, I'll get down on my knees, I'll dig in the soil, I'll take many photographs, so I, I practice the five verbs, plus I walk in rather than through wildness. That is um, that's very, very profound. And I, when you were saying, look, one of my questions I had lined up, I didn't know you were going to say see next. But when you said look, I was thinking about the, the uh, people who listen but don't hear. Um, and, and this is very oh, similar. Yeah. People look, but they don't see. Um, it's interesting, Steve. You know, quite a few years ago, uh, a mentor of mine told me that I had to work on going slower to go faster. And I was in my mid to late twenties at that point in time. And if I'm to be honest, it didn't resonate. Like I, I in fact, that's a, that's a really polite way of saying I didn't didn't get it and didn't understand. <laughs> um, and, and you know, over the past ten years now, I've I've really been playing with that and how it's it's really served me 
in terms of rapid progression through what I do is about looking and seeing as opposed to just rushing and looking. Um, and it's nuance, but it's quite profound nuance at the same time. It is a difference that makes the difference, I suppose. There's a, there's a, an, an old saying in Pennsylvania, Dutch country, the hurrier I go, the behinder I get, which I think is what you're saying. The hurrier I go, the behinder I get. So the old hare and the tortoise, uh, the tortoise gets to the end faster than the hare because he's more deliberate, more focused, more committed. Mm. And the whole look, see, believe, look, see, uh, if you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, the first traveler goes by and doesn't even see the man in the ditch. The second one sees, but doesn't bother to do anything about it. The third comes by and tends to the injured person on the side of the road. So. The, the same idea. We can't enjoy nature unless we practice those five verbs. That's it. I've been um, I've been focusing a lot recently in my in my work and, and thinking very heavily about a, an analogy um, of. Do you remember the sort of twelve inch long plastic rulers? I don't know whether you plastic ones you still whether you still get them in schools these days, but uh, certainly when I was at school, there was the twelve inch plastic ruler, and you know, joining both ends of the ruler together. Well, most people would grab the ends of the ruler and try and, and try and bend the end together, and often would snap the ruler. And I've been focusing, yeah. been focusing very heavily on actually the secret to getting the ends together is um, putting profound heat in the middle, and then the ends just droop and, and naturally meet with each other. And um, and it's quite hard to explain in terms of what that means in terms of practical life. But often that fast pace rush is grabbing the ends. And often there's a shortcut around the corner when you just stop and observe for a while and be patient and, you know, it presents itself to you. And I think that's what you're talking about, about nature. Is that right? It's a similar sort of thing? Oh, I think so. I, I, I always... Uh, preferred the wooden rollers uh, rather than the plastic rollers. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I say often that in nature, the really important, juicy, interesting, fascinating, rewarding elements uh, are hidden in plain sight. And if you rush past uh, anything you're dealing with, whether it's the, the beauty and bounty of nature or attempting to discern and solve some problem or rise to some opportunity in business in family and community, uh, if you immediately rush to the conclusion without looking deeply and understanding, uh, you're liable to break that plastic ruler in half uh, and never come to the to discerning the real problem and reaching a, a viable solution with great thought. Mm, very and and uh, d d if I were still in one of my administrative positions, at a university, I, I, I said this often, but uh, there's a disease epidemic in higher education that distills to ready, aim, 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 aim. So you, th there, there's a balance between acting too quickly and never acting. Mm. Uh, and, and it used to drive me crazy as a university CEO to have pe people want 100% of the answer before they'll make a decision. And uh, Colin Powell, General Powell here in the U.S., who was um, 
Um, was he Secretary of Defense or he's Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, but um, a d- dynamic military leader? He he once talked about the the zone for making a decision, and, and I may not get this exactly right, but he says you need to have at least fifty percent of total information. But if you wait to get more than 80, it's too late. The opportunity for acting is past. So it's what, what you're, you're saying that, um, in effect, if you bend that plastic ruler too harshly, you have made a decision without enough information. But if you wait completely until the thing with your heat melts through and breaks into two pieces, you've acted too late. I, I, that's a rough analogy. Because there, it's interesting you, you bring this up, though, because there does feel like there's a a large social mismatch between knowledge around the outdoors, climate would be a great example, Um uh, you know, we, we will run out of fossil fuels at some point in time, and that's just logical. I mean, it's it's a it's a finite resource. Um, th- there feels like there's this big mismatch though between academia and the average Joe picking it up and being able to go, I get this, and I can make this real in my life. I actually can do something about this. Where do you think that mismatch comes from? Is it com- a lack of communication or I don't know? What, where do you think it comes from? Uh, I, I, before I answer that, I'm thinking about what you said. We, we will run out of fossil fuels. Uh, not if fossil fuels run out of us first. <laughs> I'm not that- but, uh, <laughs> I, I and again, having spent 12 years in a in a Fortune 500 company and operating at, uh, within the private sector, and then spending 35 years at nine different universities, uh, and this may be too simple an answer, uh, I think universities are risk averse. Hmm. And is that the difference that you're getting at? Um, uh, I'm not sure. I ask, keep, keep probing. Yeah, it, it strikes me that um, if you've got access to Google or Google Scholar, you can go and chuck in any topic you like and get more high-quality information that's evidence-based about circumstances that that are happening with with the outdoors, with nature, or just with the if you're into economics. I mean, you can go down that rabbit hole if you want to, but there's more, there's real data out there. And it feels like the data's there. And yet, Joe, who's a plumber, who, who likes going hiking, isn't even, isn't even aware that the data's there. And if he is, doesn't actually know what to do with it or how to use it or anything else. And, and so there just appears to be a, a disconnect between the two. Um, and I'm wondering, well, some, several questions go through my head, Steve, like whose responsibility is it to, to bridge the gap? Because if the gap was bridged, you can't easily argue data. Um, well, I don't know about that, but okay, you, most people can't easily argue data. Um, but there's whose responsibility is it, and, and how do how do we take the academic environment and ce- celebrate what they do, and say m- maybe now we need to teach the academic environment how to communicate what it does more eloquently, so that Joe the plumber can grasp it and get it and use it for his for his his advantage, but also the advantage of the outdoors. And I I just wonder where that I've had the same discussion with climate change scientists on on this podcast, and I'm like. I, I get it, but all the facts, figures, and numbers, they're, they're wonderful. I'm struggling to keep up, and I'm quite active in my research and reading and whatever else. But there's 80% of the planet of the world who's not like that, who just thinks that it's too complicated to engage with. Yeah, and, and you said you can Google and get this whole universe of answers. 
Uh, the, the, the flip side is you can get on the Internet and find any answer you want. <laughs> that's so true. And, and I'm not sure that's, um, that's any better than Joe, who, Joe the plumber, who's not interested in cutting through all that fog. Uh, my my wife's dad, uh, deceased for more than a quarter of a century, um, lied about his age to enter the European theater in World War II, um, completed eight years of school. He may have been the most intelligent man I've ever met. Uh, so I, I guess I'm I'm just saying, don't sell Joe the plumber short. <laughs> mm. uh, Joe the plumber may have a more open mind about learning than any university scientist. Uh, too many of our university scientists have blinders on, established by their own findings and knowledge. So I I, I guess I want to. Having spent 35 years in higher ed, uh, I may be a little more cynical than most people about having all the answers uh, indisputably available within those uh, ivy-covered walls. Um, there, I, I've had the privilege of serving as the Chief Executive Officer of the President at the University of Alaska uh, in Fairbanks, the nation's premier Arctic university. We had a whole stable of climate scientists and atmospheric scientists studying climate change and the distribution of where they stood on the issues was bimodally distributed. They, they were clustered at one end or the other, the one end being human attribution, uh, that area that's called the consensus opinion. And on the other end, uh, that climate changes are predominantly attributable to natural, solar, um, global, ocean um, occurrences that um, it, it's... It was, in effect, at that one university, a microcosm of what it is globally with uh, the Beyond Borgs and John Kerry's on opposite ends of the spectrum, each convinced that their own perspective is correct. So I, I, I'm not sure I took that where you wanted me to go, Rob, but oh, again, fine. I just... I offer a caution that you can, in fact, in this world of the Internet, get in there and get any answer you want. Yeah, I, th I think um, there's a world of difference between Google and Google Scholar. Um, there's, <laughs> there's there, those, those, those are two very different beasts, I suppose. Um, but, but it's interesting, you know, um, there's, there's things that I know that I know to be true that I can't evidence in terms of data. And yet, um, for instance, when I first came to South Africa some 20 years ago, um, the, the, there was very consistent rains at certain times of the day. You know, it is very um, 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. The heavens were going to open. And now, 20 years later, we have no idea at all when it's going to rain. It could be 2 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon or something else. But, uh, and there's there's no attribution to fault or reason or anything else. It's just a maybe it's going back to your five things. It's just looking, seeing, and feeling and noticing that there there are changes, um, and those changes may be good, they may be bad, but but we have to appreciate there are changes, and then maybe start considering well. Uh, do we want to do something about these changes? Or are we happy with them to keep changing? I mean, I, I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong. It just seems that we blunder through the outdoors and, and miss all of the cues that it gives, gives us. Um, and I think it gives us big messages. And, and 
I, I'm a student of the of weather. Uh, I've because of my dad's fascination with the weather, I, I pay great attention to the weather wherever I happen to live. And over the course of our nearly 50 years of marriage, we've made 13 interstate moves, all in the U.S., except that our time in Alaska was considered by the moving company as an international move. <laughs> but when when we first went, we went to Alaska to Fairbanks in June. And by the by the end of August, uh, the poplars, aspen were beginning to turn yellow. And I thought, oh boy, uh, it must be because of the dry summer. And then as we got into September and made it through September, uh, I had studied the weather enough to 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 the the climatological records to know that well it was natural that things were beginning to yellow in late August because it's it's autumn there at mm. 65 degrees north that early. And after having spent that first September, experienced a couple snows, uh, some deep freezes, I asked people who had lived there all their lives and already knew the answer. I said, tell me, compare this September to the way it used to be. And without fail, Rob, people said, uh, it's much warmer. Uh, we used to get snow that would come and stay by the 20th of September. But everybody to a person said, it's just not, not as cold as it used to be. Mm. As it turned out, it was the third coldest September in the 100 years plus <laughs> they've been keeping records. So I, I I offer that there is a distinct difference between what we perceive and what we objectively observe. And, and I kind of use it, I, I don't know if I can say this, but I'll say it. I, I use weather as my bullshit filter. That is, if I if I know about the weather and start asking people, questions like that and they give me answers that I know are wrong it puts me on guard for anything they might say <laughs> but we have a way of I don't know if, if where you've lived the uh, old timers talk about uh, we used to walk three miles to school it was uphill both ways and <laughs> we were barefoot and had to walk in knee-deep snow but those kinds of things I, I'm exaggerating but there is a difference in my mind between observing and perceiving. Back in the in the 19 teens, uh, the story is that New York Harbor froze solid. And it's the only time in 120 some years that it did. And yet people today talk about how New York Harbor used to freeze over every year. So we have to be careful with what we perceive and uh, measure it against what the facts are. Mm. And I don't, I don't know how I got there, but I think it related to something we were talking about. Oh, it's, it, it's, it's very interesting. You know, I suppose um, when, when you, when people think back into the past, they, um, there's only normally two memories, and those are those are linked to pleasure or pain, right? There's immense pain or immense or, or immense pleasure, and the okay. m monotony of the grey in the middle of just the everyday life is just a, a blur that we don't recall that well. Um, and, and maybe well, maybe I, that's that's what people are talking about when, as you say, they talk about the three feet of snow and up uphill both ways to school and whatever else is that they're just pulling out that blip in that half a year as opposed to the consistent everyday experience well i don't know how much yogi berra is regarded as the as a great philosopher he's fantastic globally. but he he once said i think i have this right things ain't what they used to be and they probably never were <laughs> so he he was a sage very much so so 
Um, I, I want to move on, um, but I, I just want to pick your brains for a second. There's going to be um, people listening to this who are, or even watching this as well, who are, um, uh, uh, maybe they are the fast hikers or, or maybe they are a business leader or a, an academic or something like that. And they've, they've got some time to spend in the woods or in the outdoors. Um, while I hear believe, look, see, feel, act, how do they go and put that into practice practically? What are some of the, the, the tips you can give them so that they actually um, can go and genuinely see what's there and hear what's there and experience what's there and feel what's there? And, and this, this may be too simplistic, spoken from somebody who hasn't attempted to summit uh, even a 6,000 foot peak and get back to the base before the storm arrives or before sunset. Uh, so if someone's primary obstacle is to test him or herself and to challenge uh, an obstacle that provides technical difficulties, uh, maybe there is no time to believe, look, see, feel, but simply to act, act within the realm of the safety parameters that are guiding and controlling that particular venture. But I, I would encourage anybody, and I don't, to, to do when it's raining and you can't get out, uh, when you're preparing, weeks ahead of time. Uh, there are some great books that for me guide my whole philosophy and mindset about nature. The, the first is, and, and tell me if, if you know this one, it's A Sand County Almanac, Aldo Leopold. Uh, I'm rather American centric because I've lived here all my life. Aldo was a mid 20th century forester, wildlife biologist, conservationist, person named A-L-D-O, Leopold, and a Sand County almanac. He um, had a farm. He bought an old worn out farm uh, up along the Sand River in Wisconsin, an hour or so north of Madison, where he finished his career uh, on the faculty there in wildlife biology and forestry. But he, he writes about his love affair with nature in, in ways that are timeless. Uh, it, he calls it a Sand County almanac. His farm is in Sand County, and he chronicles the seasons of change across the year, hence almanac. Reading Leopold for me slows my internal engine down and focuses me on, helps me focus and realize why I love nature. And I think even if you're a, a wild, crazy um, mountain biker uh, who does things on the trails that would give me a heart attack even thinking about them, I think having connected that way through somebody like Leopold, then it may change how you think about that that mountain trail where you're on the verge of breaking every bone in your body. Uh, another kind of uh, another one of those books is Edward Abbey, A B B E Y. I think mm. Edward Abbey. Mid 20th century, also, maybe a little bit later, uh, he wrote The Monkey Wrench Gang, which is about uh, eco, uh, let's say, people who are engaged in potentially criminal activities to stop logging and land clearing and those kind of things. But the book I'm talking about that he wrote is called uh, oh, Desert Solitaire. 
And it's about the time, the years he spent in the American Southwest, in the Arches, what is now the Arches National Park, the Moab area. And, and he talks about the deep connection he developed in that wild Zurich landscape. Uh, tremendous heat. But again, he, he writes in a way that focuses on this passion for nature that you can feel whether you're climbing a, a, a technical rock ascent or paddling around North America. I don't do whatever high adventure you might do where you don't have the luxury in, in action to do the look, see, feel, believe thing in, in slow motion. Uh, he's, he, they, they, these writers, philosophers can set the stage internally so that you still pay attention to those things even though you're acting in rapid, almost death-defying means in the field. And, and there are many other books as well. Those two just pop to mind. And um, I'll stop there with, with those two as bookmarks. Mm. I've read um, Dick Prennicke's book. I think it's called One Man's Alaska. Um, I, I must have read it four or five times, and uh, it's a it's a wonderful balance of um, adventure, overcoming adversity, um, what one man can do, can achieve on his own in a sh- or in, sh- in a relatively short period of time, um, but equally his observations of nature, um, of, of the animals, and um, him celebrating, you know, uh, out. I was about to say outwitting the devil. That's a different book, but outwitting the the moose, outwitting the bear, and outwitting the birds who want to steal his food, and and things like that. Um, and and just how clever the animals are in and around where he built his cabin and whatever else. Um, that you know, for I think for two years, every moment he thought he had it dialed to preserve his food and stop the animals getting at it. That nature proved him wrong. Um, but it, it's equally, uh, and it also celebrates joys for him as well. You know, the, the joy of the change of season, the, the joy of the, of the float plane pilot popping in to say hello once every two or three months, and then he's got two or three months on his own. Yeah. Um, it's just a, an incredible book. And I think I'm going to go and read these two, but uh, I think all of us need books that bring us back to the moment and bring us back to the present and back to... Oh, I don't know. There, there is this stuff that's going on in and around me that I'm not, not necessarily aware of. Um, it's, it's fascinating. Well, I, I've read that book. I don't remember the author's name, but yeah, it's, it's somewhere on my bookshelf behind me in my Alaska archives. And so you don't think I'm entirely American centric. Um, <laughs> I love the way Robert McFarlane, McFarlane, Mm. writes about the the British Isles and his long hikes there. It's the same kind of almost philosophical, spiritual perspective on nature. One of my favorites I'm looking at now is simply called Landmarks. Another one is The Wild Places. So there's a, a Brit who writes beautifully and philosophically about sacred spiritual kinds of adventures in nature. Mm, it's incredible. So let's let's move on. Um, you've mentioned Alaska. You've mentioned John Muir. Um, but uh, in our last conversation, you maybe I became aware that you've been involved with the Nature Conservancy. Um, and I, I, I just wonder, I loved what you said, that they're, they're busy saving the outdoors the old-fashioned way by buying it. Um, or something, yes. that was your, your quote. Tell me more about your time with the Nature Conservancy, what you did with them, and and maybe what what you think they're getting really right with regards to preserving the outdoors. Yeah, and and I'll start way back in 1973 when I first accepted the position with the paper and allied manufacturing company located in 
I was located in southeastern Virginia in the coastal plain there. And within uh, the, the first year of my arrival, the company donated 50,000 acres of the great dismal swamp in southeastern Virginia, northwestern North Carolina, donated those 50,000 acres to the Nature Conservancy. And I can still close my eyes and picture the, the, the company quarterly magazine focusing on the Great Dismal Swamp, surveyed in part by George Washington, and uh, a, a remote, rather inaccessible, wild, wild area. And I thought, wow, I picked the right company, a company that realizes they, they have an obligation to the future to preserve wild places and to do it selflessly through a donation. I didn't know the Nature Conservancy existed until then. And then I was a member, uh, a dues paying member over the course of time. And then when I went to Alaska, the local, the, the state chapter of the Nature Conservancy in part, not because of who I was, but because I was chancellor of the university uh, and I had a natural resources background, they asked me, would I serve on their board, the board of the Alaska Nature Conservancy? And I, I leaped at the opportunity, uh, or I leapt at the opportunity. I think it's leaped. Uh, work, work, work with me on the grammar here. Motto right? tomato. <laughs> Yeah, I jumped at the opportunity. <laughs> and uh, for the, the three or four years I served on it, uh, we immersed uh, as a board in discussing uh, how do we rehabilitate the badly damaged salmon ecosystem of the Tongass National Forest. Uh, as a forester, as a former timber beast, uh, I, I had watched the Tongass controversy from afar for years, and this was the first opportunity I had to get out on the Tongass, and uh, the timber beast in me said, oh my God, why would anybody harvest these steep, these terribly steep slopes? Uh, I couldn't believe what we, the Forest Service, had done. And in the course of logging those steep slopes, building roads, um, they had spent more to extract the timber than they realized from the sale of the timber. And they had through culverts and poorly placed drainage structures for the, for the access roads, blocked uh, many, many, many hundreds of miles of upstream salmon habitat. And uh, it was the first time I'd seen what I thought was devastating logging impacts. And again, from a guy whose paycheck for 12 years came from a company that harvested timber uh, and manufactured paper and wood products from it. So the Nature Conservancy, in my mind, in Alaska, was asking the right questions, engaging in the right issues. And it was a wonderful opportunity to, for me to see what that particular NGO did in that one state. And are they doing the right thing? Uh, I can't, I don't have enough information to say other than my perception is that they do good work. And their, their motto, their tagline used to be, we preserve, we, we preserve, I forget what they called it. We we preserve nature the old-fashioned way we buy it. And they are, in my mind, uh, a global NGO that's doing good work to preserve species, wild places of high and lasting value so that they are permanently preserved for future generations. Uh, they have a major project near me here in northern Alabama, uh, the paint, 
Paint Rock River project where they're preserving native habitat for valuable um, biodiversity concerns. So again, if they're not doing good things, I'm not hearing about those things they're doing that aren't good. Hmm. Is it, it, <laughs> it strikes me if, if we're looking about the, the future of the outdoors and preserving nature that um, <laughs> you can either spend a lot of time and effort bringing people on side or, or, or you actually can gain control of it and say, hey, this, this is open access for people, but here's the terms and conditions um, for, for open access. I mean, in, in the UK, the John Muir Trust owns large chunks of uh, mountain ranges, which it, mm. it, which it then gives back to the National Trust for management underneath certain provisos, you know, that it's maintained, it's looked after, people are only permitted under certain times of the year in certain ways. Um, and and I'm, I'm a bit torn. The educator in me wants to educate the world enough so that we don't have to do that. And then the pragmatist inside of me says, I don't think I've got enough time and energy in my lifetime, so I'm just going to make as many million dollars as possible and then just go go do it the other way. Um, uh, and I suppose that's what drew me to the Nature Conservancy is, is that pragmatic approach to, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we can just go and buy large chunks of the countryside and say it's, it's, my, it, it's the countryside's way or the highway maybe. Well, in the Nature Conservancy, uh, I I haven't looked at their website in a while, but in Alaska, part of our our effort involved education, uh, and it's a fundamental part of it. And I spent a, a number of years of my academic career in something we call cooperative extension. Uh, the the several universities where I worked, we had a cooperative venture with state government, local government, and federal government through the U.S. Department of Agriculture to extend the knowledge base of the university to the people of the counties, the, the local governmental jurisdictions, and the state. And the idea was to put knowledge to work, uh, to add value to knowledge by addressing in cooperation with those entities, real problems faced by real people in real time. And we would partner occasionally with the Nature Conservancy, often with state governmental agencies like park systems and uh, bureaus of forestry. And uh, the entire package of conservation uh, rests on helping people know more and convincing them that the causes are worthwhile. Mm. And I'm on the board of the Alabama State Parks Foundation here. And the park system with 48,000 acres in 21 different parks uh, has a three-legged set of objectives. One is to preserve these special places, but not to preserve without recreation being a fundamental second stool. And education is a, a primary function on equal footing with preserve, recreate, and educate. Because I don't, I don't know how much you can accomplish of anything in any endeavor unless you're dealing with the public and with the managing entities, uh, unless they are informed and through informed and inspired responsible. Mm. That was a long answer. That's good. But education like is key. We have a, a saying in We Get Outdoors that uh, and part of our mission is um, people look after what they love. 
Um, and in general terms, throughout the world and your life, that that is true. I mean, if you if you love your wife, you'll look after her. I mean, it all, and, and vice versa. Um, and I think that a lot of people have forgotten how to love the outdoors. Um, and I think that if the future of preservation, in my mind, is education almost comes second to love. Um, if you, you love inspires you to do all sorts of very cool and crazy things. And um, I think that if, if we can get more of the world to love the outdoors, then they'll be more receptive to knowledge, education. Um, it, it always blows my, my mind when um, people mention things like leave no trace. And, st- and yet you still go to a, a, a state park or a national park on a Monday morning and find the rangers there picking up trash from the weekend where people have just chucked their garbage away. And those people just don't love the outdoors enough. If they did, they wouldn't do it. Or at least that's my simplistic philosophy. Um, and, and so maybe that's the thing. Um, maybe that's the thing we need to learn. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but it's certainly my mission and where I'm going. Oh, yeah, I agree. I, nothing disturbs me more than to go out. There's a cigarette, but uh, oh. uh, there's a fresh initials cut into a beach, into the beach bark. And, and Aldo Leopold, who I mentioned a bit ago, a- actually had a concern about, uh, he used the word cherish rather than love, but he said, th- this is going to be close to an exact quote. He said, Conservation of all wildness is self-defeating. For to cherish, we must see and fondle. And when enough have seen and fondled, there is no wildness left to cherish. Uh, I think if if I could spend a day or two without Leopold now, he's been dead since 1948, uh, once I got over the initial shock, I, I would I would like to take him to some of our U.S. national parks or even our state parks here in Alabama, because I I think the Park Service and the park system here in Alabama have done a phenomenal job in balancing use and enjoyment with overuse and degradation. I am convinced that the the systems, at least that I'm familiar with, have done a good job of prohibiting over-cherishing and destruction. And I think we're on target to continue that as long as our population doesn't grow from 7.7 billion to 17 billion. I think we can manage it. And part of that, it, it is controlling the number of people, the number of daily users. But I'm convinced w- with appropriate management, we can assure that as many people as possible cherish without jeopardizing what is available to cherish in the future. Mm. I have a little um, thing in my head I've experienced in the well, an experience in the Pacific Northwest where um, I think people can become very lazy and very habitualized to always access it, accessing the same, the outdoors in the same way, in the same place at the same time. On the same day of the week, you know, Sunday afternoon would be a great example of people going for a, a hike or a walk somewhere and all the parking lots are full. Um, and... Uh, I don't like sharing the outdoors that much. If I'm to be truthful, I, I much prefer peace, <laughs> quiet, and, and less people. And um, so I, I used to drive, this is in the Baker Lake or Mount Baker area. I, I used to drive further around the mountain and go and access the, the national forest um, and, and go and explore and have my adventures and outdoor times in the national forest where there, there wasn't people and there isn't a pre-organized car park. And it just struck me that it's accessible um, easily accessible. It's just that people have maybe lost the willingness to to explore or adventure. 
or they they want to hike on the the trail and the path as opposed to following the ridge line and seeing where it takes you to and seeing what views you can find and exploring to find something new be it a i don't know uh, uh, observing the ants building their anthill i mean that would be a that, that that's a incredible thing to see all the way through yeah. to, to observing some magnificent view that very few people have seen for a mountain from a different angle. Um, and, and I think maybe one of the things for the outdoors that needs to change is we need to break the laziness cycle. We need to go and get people going to new places and exploring new things to spread the load on the outdoors. Yeah. And, and the, the, the flip side of that, I look through my lens of having crossed from age 69 to 70, the, 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 the portfolio of places I can explore is shrinking. Uh, I, I can't, there's no way I can do now what I used to could. Here in the Southern US, used to could is a word, but uh, I, I am not, my knees won't tolerate the kind of hiking I used to do. And um, so I, I just urge you to be considerate of those who are no longer of youthful vigor the way we used to be. I can dream. I can go to new places, wonderful, wild, uh, exotic places if someone takes me there via video camera. Which which leads me back to one other thing. If you haven't watched the Ken Burns series on the national, the U.S. national parks, I encourage everybody who has the, an iota of appreciation for wildness to take a to, to, to go through the entire Ken Burns uh, series on the national park system in the U.S. Mm. Uh, it's phenomenal. Ken is a magician and a wizard, and um, he's done a number of other such programs. But th this one, given our conversation about nature and wildness, is superlative. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Well, I, I, I haven't checked that out, so I'm going to. It's on my little list. Um, but you've mentioned several times now that uh, retirement happened, and uh, you know, just tipping over the seven into the over over the seventh decade. And um, talk to me about the the Great Blue Heron project. Like, what, what is it? Where did it come from? Um, is it your retirement business, hobby, passion, or all of the above? Oh, it's it, it. If you can have a business that its intent is not to make money, but to try to make a difference. I, I called my retirement enterprise uh, Great Blue Heron. And a lot of people have asked me, why Great Blue Heron? And uh, the, I'll, I'll give you the, the moderate length explanation. Mm. Uh, Dad was always fascinated with these magnificent birds of prey. Uh, Great Blue Heron stands about four and a half feet from its feet to the top of its head. And it, it's a keen predator along streams and ponds and lake shores, eating everything from small turtles to frogs to fish, I suppose even large insects. And Dad always pointed them out. We like to see them comment on them. And dad died in February of uh, 1995. And at that point in my life, uh, I was a distance runner. I competed, competed. Uh, that doesn't mean I placed high on any finish line, but I competed in marathons, half marathons, 10Ks, and I ran uh religiously i tried not to miss a day the day of dad's memorial service in february uh up near our home in western maryland uh dawned um, single digits fahrenheit so very cold 
uh, I went out uh, as the sky was beginning to brighten a little bit for a 10 mile loop that would take me up along a stream where uh, he and he and us boys where we used to go for fishing and wading and salamander and crawdad hunting. And about three and a half miles out, I was running along a road about a hundred feet vertical above Ebitz Creek. And the 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 dawn had broken strongly then. And I looked down and the creek mostly frozen, but as it came around a 90 degree bend, the water moving fast enough that there was some ice-free water. And I saw movement and there was a great blue heron standing in the water. And he was looking at me. I say he, I, it might've been a female, but uh, for the purposes of the story, it was a he. And as runners do, when I stopped to look at him, I hit my stopwatch. Uh, I didn't want to be charged with time for standing there. <laughs> and, and we we locked eyes for, I know it was a minute. And the sun had just broken above the ridge to the east. And uh, he he lifted his wings, didn't fly downstream or upstream. He just slowly lifted. And his he he passed by the orb of the sun rising above the hill, and I didn't see him beyond that. He he ascended to who knows where, and it it was it was Dad. I felt certain I know saying goodbye. So great blue heron sticks with me. Uh, we live on a a four acre pond. I I call it a lake but it's a, it's four acres and when we came here looking for our retirement home site vacant lot and as we stood there at the shoreline was a great blue air so uh we have a resident great blue here and uh it's 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 got a great deal of emotional connection for me so great blue heron is what i call this concern and what are you looking to do with the concern um, with with the great blue heron? I mean, uh, uh, what 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 would your best aspirations be for it achieving? Oh, I I thought initially when I created it that I would do a lot of consulting and uh, generate revenue, but um, that that hasn't really transpired. I've done some work. I I did um a week over in uh, Kazakhstan with a university there uh, that I did under the banner of Great Blue Heron, but it really had more to do with my expertise from serving as a university CEO for four universities and uh, gave me an excuse to visit three national parks in Kazakhstan and write about them. Uh, Most of what I do it, well, I'm working on another project in Ohio uh, under the banner of Great Blue Heron. But most of what I'm doing is writing. I publish weekly posts on photo essays on what I call nature-inspired life and living. And I, I hope maybe I can have you put the, the particulars on um, on your site on how to um, subscribe it, you get exactly what you pay for um, <laughs> and, and that is it costs nothing <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm I would like to launch into a more productive inspiration education element with my great blue hair and I am uh, I I am the whole social media universe is foreign to me uh, every time I'm in the forest now I'll uh, I'll record uh, anywhere from a minute to a four minute video reflecting on where I am what I see and trying to inspire and educate about nature through those videos so i i would like to find a way to 
leverage what I'm doing so that instead of reaching uh, X number of people, I can raise X to the power of 10 or twice to the power of 10. I, I would like to use my passion for nature and my knowledge of nature with the BS, 50 years of practice and the PhD to inspire, educate, and inform more people to realize the joy of loving nature and of being in nature, whether it's some epic adventure or a simple walk through the local city park. Uh, I want to spread the gospel of what I call nature-inspired life and living. Uh, I want to plant the seed. Robert Louis Stevenson said, um, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you sow. Uh, I, I wrote my books under the banner of Great Blue Heron, and I've learned through my three books how to make a small fortune. And that is you start with a large fortune because with my three books, they've been a revenue train. <laughs> so the, the, I, I'm just inspired. Uh, I'm motivated to try to bring, just as you're doing with We Get Outdoors, I want to bring more people into the fold. I want to get more people excited about nature, and I want more people to practice what I call informed and responsible earth stewardship. And if I can give you one more quote, that mm. this from, how, how are we doing on time? I don't have my reading glasses on. Do I? You're all good. Carry on. Uh, Lewis Bromfield, uh, an American author back in the mid 20th century. Uh, he wrote many, many novels, uh, six or seven of them made into blockbuster Hollywood movies. He bought in the 1930s what he called his old worn out farm in north central Ohio. Uh, his, he donated his land upon his death to the state of Ohio to create a, a state park called Malabar State Park. The, the name he gave to the farm was Malabar. Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall were married in his farmhouse. So he was intimately connected to the Hollywood crowd, but wanted to stay on his farm. And he dedicated his life and his fortune to rehabilitating this old worn out farm. He wrote uh, an a nonfiction book called Pleasant Valley that chronicled his life dedicated to rehabilitating the farm. And in that, and I'm going to get this close to an exact quote. He said, the land came to us out of eternity. And when the youngest of us associated with it dies, it will still be here. The best any of us can hope to accomplish during our fleeting existence is to make some small corner of this earth better through wisdom, knowledge, and hard work. And in effect, that, that, that tells the story of what I hope to accomplish in retirement. Uh, I want to change some small corner of the world for the better, whether it's through my own actions or the actions of those I can, again, bring into the fold. Uh, I'm hoping that through things like this 90-minute conversation with you, maybe there's a foothold to be gained. Maybe there's a mind to be changed. Uh, uh, somebody to be inspired. Mm. There's a, um, a Swedish psychologist whose name, I think his name is Ben Furman, but it is, I might have that incorrect. But uh, he says we have to celebrate every drop because every drop is responsible for filling the bucket. And um, I, I really like that. I think all too often we're chasing two bigger things without recognizing that if we all do lots of small things, the accumulative effect 
is is quite profound. Um, and so, Steve, I just want to thank you for adding some drops to help fill the bucket. Um, your drops, my drops, and many other people's drops will 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 keep nature there for your grandchildren, my great grandchildren, who knows into the future. Um, but equally, I, I, I want to thank you for having for all of the time, effort, work, and dedication that you put into maintaining the outdoors for all of us over your your many years of passion of nature and the outdoors. Because um, if if we could all go and put in as much as you have, the, the world would be a lot better place. So thank you so much for your time this evening. Well, thank you, Rob. I enjoyed it. Uh, maybe we can do something like this again. Uh, even if it only involves meeting each other face to face and raising a glass. I, I, if, if we're talking about beer or coffee, I'm in for both, uh, but just not at the same right, time. This is because it's still morning here. This is coffee. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> later it will be beer. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, great. Thank you, Rob. My Thank compliments, you. and I applaud you for your work. Thank you very much. That's very kind. I'm humbled. Um, folks, um, if you want to check out um, any of Steve's work, his books, the books he's recommended, or Great Blue Heron, um, please check out the description below and go and give um, Steve's Facebook page some love and, and check out what he does because uh, his stuff's inspirational and, and I know it'll make the world a better place and your life better as well. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>